We live in a sad world. I was, you, you may have heard this on the news, and I'm going to switch microphones here. Friday in, in Memphis, a lady stabbed her four children to death. And the reason I bring that up is because I was reading some comments from the Memphis Commercial Appeal about the story and the comments on there. The first one was, Hey, you Christians, where was your Jesus when this happened? That was the first comment. And I've been thinking about that. And you know what the sad... It's just a fact that's so sad is that people... Even Christians don't really understand this. That everything in life is a choice. Even after you, you accept Jesus as your Savior, your choices and choosing has not ended. There's going to be a choice of how you choose to live your life for Christ. There are choices of how much of God's Word you're going to read and understand. The Word of God says this, Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know the only way to understand God's grace is to have knowledge of Him? That's the only way you're ever going to understand it. Grow in the grace and knowledge. Well, how can you grow in grace without any knowledge of God? For the Word is God, right? Jesus is the Word. So if you're going to grow in grace, so it becomes a choice of even how much of the Word you're going to understand, of how much of the Word you're going to believe. Are you going to believe all of this Word or are you just going to believe part of this Word? Are we, going to, are we going to preach all of this word or are we just going to leave out the things that offend people? Now there's a lot of people that get offended at the Holy Spirit because of lack of understanding. Now we've been teaching for the last three Wednesday nights on the Holy Spirit and we're not near finished. So you need to be here on Wednesday nights to continue that teaching. But this morning I'm going to preach a message Entitled, The Baptism in the Holy Spirit is for You. The Baptism in the Holy Spirit is for You. You must... And now the reason a lot of people don't receive the Baptism of the Holy Spirit is simply because they don't understand it and they make this kind of confession. Well, when God wants me to have it, He'll give it to me. That is a false premise and you should reject that in the name of Jesus. God doesn't, is not going to give you anything that you don't want. And most of the time, people who make that statement, the, the bottom line is they don't want to pursue the Holy Spirit. That's the bottom line. It becomes a choice. Many Christians have overlooked or rejected the Holy Spirit to their own peril. Their own loss. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 47 through 53. Luke, chapter 24, verses 47 through 53. Now, Jesus started this, this uh, saying in verse 46, but I want to start with verse 47. It's in quotations. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these. Behold these things. Behold, I want you to notice right here. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Now what did we learn Wednesday night in our Bible study? There's only one promise that is called the promise in the Bible. And that is the promise of the Holy Spirit. He is called the promise. Now, do, how, how do, how, out of almost 7,000 promises in God's Word, only one is called the promise. The promise of the Father was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the promise. And that's to you, to your children, to your children's children, to every generation, it is to everybody. This promise. He said, Behold, I send the promise. And notice, promise there is capitalized. I send the promise of my Father because the Holy Spirit is the promise of the Father. That is a title. He is the promised one. He is the promised one. He is the promised one from the Father. 
Upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Now he's talking to the disciples. And then he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. I want you to visualize this this morning. I want you to see Jesus with his disciples, and he's told them about the promise of the Father, and they're to go to Jerusalem, and they're to tarry, and then he lifts his hands, and he begins to bless them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Wow. Right before their eyes. And they worshipped him. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. So be it. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the promise of the Father. I thank you that the promise of the Father is in this service this morning. I thank you that the promise of the Father is living in my heart today. I thank you that the promise of the Father is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of grace, the Spirit of love, the Spirit of peace, the Spirit of joy, the Spirit of holiness. I thank you for, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. And I pray right now, Holy Spirit, have your way in this service And we pray for a mighty baptism of power to take place on this Independence Day Eve 2016 here at Restoration Christian Fellowship. I thank you and I praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. Amen. The baptism in the Holy Spirit will absolutely change your life. Boy, that was kind of weak, wasn't it? The baptism in the Holy Spirit will absolutely change your life. Salvation changes you, but the baptism in the Holy Spirit will absolutely... Now, absolute means there's no doubt about it. Something that is absolute means there's no doubt. Do you have any absolute values that you will hold to and nobody is going to change those values? I absolutely will never accept same-sex marriage. That is an absolute in my life. I will not accept it. It's an absolute. I absolutely believe that this book is the Word of God inspired by the Holy Spirit and it is for you and it is for me and nobody's ever going to convince me that this book is not real, is not true, and will not guide my life. I absolutely believe that the baptism in the Holy Spirit will change your life. If you are running into the same wall, if you're running into the same thing, time after time after time after time, let me challenge you, get full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, the Lord's got me pumped up, that's for sure. I'll try, I'll, I'll try to hold it back a little, rein it in here. Today, you're going to see that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is for you. I want you to point your finger at yourself and say, The Holy Spirit is for me. me. Now I want you to say, The baptism in the Holy Spirit is for me. Because all of you that are Christians, the Holy Spirit is living in you. But then there is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All right, so here we go. Y'all ready? Buckle your seatbelt, put on your steel-toed shoes, and here we go. You see the disciples, and I heard Paul's teaching this morning, and I kept saying, shh, shh, in the office, because he was right all over everything I was talking about. But that's just how the Holy Spirit does things, okay? So if you were in Sunday school, you, this first part you might, you, you've heard a little bit in Paul's teaching this morning. For three and a half years, the disciples followed Jesus. They spent three and a half years with Jesus. After three and a half years of spending time with Jesus, when it came time for Jesus' crucifixion, Peter denied that even knew him. Is that not right? He even denied Jesus with curses. As a matter of fact, the disciples, after the death of Jesus, they went back fishing. And it was the women who found the empty tomb. Not the disciples. Not the ones that had spent three and a half years with him. Not the one that had heard him teach on on, all the words of God. 
Not the ones that had sat and listened to him on the Mount of Olives. Not the one that had heard him teach at the Beatitudes. Not the ones that had even been at the tomb of Lazarus when he raised him from the dead. All of this, all of this, and they had gone back fishing. And it was the women that were there for three and a half years. And then so, so you would think after all this time, now let's, let's fast forward about seven weeks from Peter denying Jesus seven weeks forward to the day of Pentecost. You find the same Peter that had denied Jesus seven weeks previous and had gone fishing. Now he's standing in Jerusalem and he's preaching an anointed message to thousands in Jerusalem. Many in this same crowd, undoubtedly, many of those thousands that had gathered in Jerusalem seven weeks prior had been right there in, the, in Pilate's judgment hall hollering, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Not only had Peter denied Jesus, but many in that crowd that had gathered in Jerusalem had also undoubtedly, I can't prove that beyond the shadow of any doubt, but just common sense would tell you there were people there that had wanted to crucify Jesus and probably was in favor of crucifying Jesus. And now here Peter, the one who denied Jesus, is standing up and he's preaching under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. What happened? What's the difference? What got hold of Peter? The result of that message was 3,000 got saved. What changed? What changed? Jesus wasn't even there. He was at the right hand of the Father. He wasn't walking with them anymore. He wasn't taking steps with them. He wasn't walking the dusty shores and the dusty roads of Galilee. He wasn't, he wasn't out among the crowds and, and people weren't able to touch the hem of His garment anymore. He wasn't speaking. He wasn't teaching. He was in heaven. So how did Peter change from the man that had been taught for, with Jesus and walked with Him personally for three and a half years and then denied Him and now all of a sudden He's standing up under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and He's preaching an anointed message and 3,000 people get saved. What made the difference? The same thing that will make a difference in your life. The same thing that will make a difference in your life. If you're here this morning and you haven't been baptized in the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you today, this is your day. You need to understand that this is for you. This is for you. It will make a difference. The Holy Spirit, He will make a difference in your life. He will fill you with power from on high. So as we look at this second point, what made the difference? Well, you're gonna, I'm going to show you what made the difference. First of all, Peter was among the 120 who experienced the first New Testament experience of having received the promise. He was among the first 120. It was important to Jesus that his followers be filled with the Holy Spirit. How many of y'all believe that? Was that important to Jesus? Do you think it's still important to Jesus? Well, if it's important to Jesus, why shouldn't it be important to us? If it's important to Jesus, why shouldn't it be important with us? You say, how, how do you know it was important to Jesus? Because Jesus told His disciples, don't go out and minister until you are endued with power. He forbid them from going anywhere other than Jerusalem to wait for the promise of the Father. He forbid them to go anywhere else other than Jerusalem. Well, were there lost people? Were there lost people that they could have been ministering to? I mean, after all, they just saw him do what? They just saw him ascend to heaven, didn't they? Boy, what a testimony that was going to be. Go out there and say, Dan, man, you wouldn't believe what I saw yesterday. I was standing out there and Jesus appeared and he raised his hands and he blessed us and all of a sudden he ascended into heaven. Wouldn't you like to know that man? But Jesus said, you can't tell him yet. You can't tell them yet. You can't share that yet. 
You've got to go to Jerusalem and wait till you are endued with power. You've got to go to Jerusalem and wait until the promise of the Father has come upon you. The promise of the Father has come upon you. You've got to wait there. So 400, I got 488, it was actually 489 plus the 11 because they had not uh, replaced uh, uh, Judas yet. But so 488 people, 489 people went to Jerusalem and they began to wait. And they waited. And they waited. And the numbers dwindled. And they waited. And they waited. And the numbers dwindled. Day number five rolls around and they're still waiting. They're waiting on the promise. They don't know what it looks like. They don't know what it smells like. All they know is He's the promise of the Father and is supposed to do them with power. So they waited. Day number seven rolls around. More people go away. Ah, I'm tired of waiting on this. I'm not going to hang around here any longer. You know, I've waited seven days. I've waited a week. Uh, I got tickled. Randy was telling me this morning, you're going to love this, Ashley and Paul. Ethan was uh, in Sunday school and Randy, they were teaching on fasting. And they got, and, and finally Ethan raised his hand. He said, you know what? I don't believe I'm ever going to do that because I don't want to miss a meal. <laughs> Raise up a child in the way they should go and when they're old they won't depart from it. <laughs> Some people though after a week they gave up. How many of y'all have given up on... Now, you might not want to raise your hand, but how many of you have given up on a promise that God has made to you before? You're not alone, sister. They give up. Day eight rolls around. The numbers are down to probably under 200 by this point. Started out with 500. Day nine rolls around. More people left. When day 10 dawned, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there were now 120. 380 had left. 380 gave up. 380 could not wait the 10th day for the promise of the Father. Can you imagine the people on that ninth day that had left and said, man, if I'd have just hung on one more day, I would, have been, I would have experienced what they experienced in the upper room. I would have heard the mighty rushing wind. I would have seen the cloven tongues of fire. I would have been in the very first New Testament day of Pentecost. Hang on. Just one more day. Just one more day. Don't give up on the promise of the Father. Don't give up on the promise of the Father. Don't even give up on the things that God has promised you personally. There's no giving up. There's no quit in the Christian. That is not in our vocabulary. We don't stop. We don't step back. We don't turn our back. We keep marching forward to the beat of the drum of the Holy Spirit. And I can tell y'all are really enthused about that. I'm preaching a whole lot better than y'all are listening. I hope. So after three and a half years of intensive, daily, on-the-job training, explaining the Word of God to them, modeling good behavior, Jesus determined these men were not fully ready for New Testament ministry. Now notice I said not fully ready. There are people out there today that are ministering, New Testament ministry. They're ready, but they're not fully ready. They're, they're ready. They're saved. I, I'm, not, I'm not throwing off. If, if people that are out there that are, that are not baptizing the Holy Spirit, they're getting people saved, and they're satisfied. The disciples could have done the same thing. But Jesus said, uh-uh. You've got to wait until you be endued with power. You are not fully ready for New Testament ministry. Now, I need to ask you something. What is the difference between New Testament ministry? Well, you stop and think about New Testament ministry and you compare the church of the New Testament to the temple of the Old Testament. And you tell me what the difference is. The Holy Spirit. The power of the New Testament church. You see, the Holy Spirit would show up in increments in the Old Testament for special, special things, you know, uh, follow Aaron and, and, and Moses and, and, and so on and so forth. And, 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 but in the New Testament, this became widespread. It was for everybody. 
was for everybody. It wasn't just for Kelly. It wasn't just for Lynn. It was for everybody, this, this promise of the Father. Is God going to make a promise generally to the, in His Word, but He's going to exclude you from it, Tom? No, He's not going to exclude you. If, he, if this is the promise of the Father, He doesn't exclude you, Jeff or Julie. Nobody in here is excluded because it's the promise of the Father to everybody. You may feel like, well, that's really not for me. Guess what? You're wrong. Flat out, you are wrong. It is for you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for you. And so Jesus would not allow them because they were not fully prepared for New Testament ministry. Are you fully prepared for 2016 style of ministry? Where you've got to battle devils every time you turn around. You've got to battle a nation that is now only 25% of the, of the United States now claims to be evangelical Christians and people that have no church affiliation and don't want to be affiliated with any denomination, any Christian, don't want to be affiliated with Jesus or any religion is up to 23%. It's almost more than evangelical Christians. We have a nation that is absolutely, absolutely, one of those absolutes, that has directed their attention to making the church as irrelevant as they possibly can. When they took prayer out of the schools in the 1960s, it started the ball rolling because we accepted it. And so now, where have we got to? Where, we are, where are we on July 3rd, 2016 in this nation? Fixing to celebrate our 200 and something birthday. I don't know how, which one it is. But we are as far away from God as this nation has ever been. This nation has never been this far removed from God as it is today. Are you fully prepared to deal with that in the world? If those disciples weren't fully prepared to deal with the world they lived in, what makes you think that you're prepared to deal with the world that we live in? You see, to get a person saved, you've got to convince them that they're lost, right? You, well, to get a person filled with the Holy Ghost these days, you've got to convince them that they need Him. And that's what I'm trying to do this morning is to convince you that you need the same thing the apostles needed. I was reading this article. This pastor in, in Kentucky in the Bible Belt was talking about the perils of the church and, and the, the struggles that the church faced. As a matter of fact, in 2014, the Southern Baptist Church lost 200,000 members. The first time ever. At one point, the Assemblies of God was the fastest growing denomination on the face of the earth. Now, it's not them. Is that the world we live in? Is that the world we're living in? Are you ready? Are you ready to go out there? I recall when I was in Bible college, we was in a missions class. We had to take, you know, missions and, and understand foreign missions and home missions and all this. And, and so, uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Gines was our professor, her and her husband. They were both missionaries. Elmer Gines, I believe, was the name. Anyway, that's irrelevant. She told us that there was a young man that he decided he wanted to be a missionary. And they keep telling these missionaries, you know, if you're going to be a missionary, you've got to be, full with, you've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Because when you get over to these foreign countries, your demon-possessed people are just going to walk right up to you. You're going to face tribes where the tribal leader is fully possessed with the devil. And, and he wasn't, you know, he, oh, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm, I'm fine. Well, he went on his first missions trip, and when he got off the airplane, uh, off of the, it, it, they flew him into the jungle, and there's on a little small plane, and flew into the jungle to meet the tribal chief. And the tribal chief walked up to this young man, and he looked at the, the Dr. Gines, and then he looked at this young man, and he said, I know he's following Jesus. He said, but I don't sense Jesus in you at all. And the tribal chief began to manifest demonic spirits and was coming after this young fella. He got on the airplane and he flew back to the United States. He wasn't ready. He wasn't ready. You go down to Piggly Wiggly and you run into the, to the alcoholic or you run into the prostitute or you run into somebody that doesn't know what's going on. You see, they don't understand the Jesus that you're serving. They don't have the Word living in them. They don't have the Holy Spirit living in them. So they've made all these bad choices. They've made all these wrong choices. And they don't understand you. But I'll tell you what. The Holy Spirit understands them. The Holy Spirit understands them. And when you will walk in there full of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will speak through you and you will understand where they are. And He will give you words. Are you ready for the world that we live in? Are you ready out there? Oh, we come to church and we dance and we shout and we do all those things and it's great and it's wonderful. But then we wake up on Monday and we go out into a world that is rejecting Jesus every single day, making fun of Him. And all it does is make us mad, but we don't do anything. You need the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost. If the disciples needed the Holy Ghost to get ready for New Testament ministry, I need the Holy Ghost to get ready for ministry in 2016. Can you say amen? I need the Holy Ghost to be ready for New Testament ministry in 2016. Hallelujah. So we find, after three and a half years, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 5, they were promised they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And guess what? In Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, They were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And yes, they spoke in tongues. I'm not afraid of tongues. I'm not afraid for you to hear me speak in tongues. I'm not afraid to hear you speak in tongues. It's a part of the promise. That's a part of the promise. They were promised that they would receive the promise. And they received the promise... In Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. The results of their baptism were immediate. And quite astonishing. The formerly Christ denying Peter. Preached an anointed message as I've already mentioned. And 3,000 got saved. What a difference the Holy Spirit made in his life. Can you say amen to that? What a difference the Holy Spirit made. Peter and John fresh from revival. Woo! How would you like to walk out of here fresh from revival? Somebody say, how was church today? You say, man, a revival spirit. Folks are getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. People are getting saved. They're falling on their knees. as repenting. I believe that they're coming the day when they step out of their car. If they're, under, if they're a sinner, they're going to fall on their knees at their car and say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. And then they'll come in the church and they'll worship Jesus Christ. Are you praying for that today? Are you praying for that today? It's happened before. It can happen again. Yeah, I'm pumped up. Because this is religious freedom that I've got. I made a choice to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. I didn't wait and say, God, you just fill me when you get ready. I made a choice. God, I want it. I want it. I got baptized at a youth camp in Hot Springs, Arkansas. I never will forget it, kneeling at an altar. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost came on me and the tongues began to flow and they hadn't stopped since. 
I'm telling you today, the Holy Ghost is for you. This sounds like old brush arbor preaching, doesn't it? Woo, hallelujah. Acts chapter 3. They fresh from revival. And then chapter 4, verse number 4, it says 2,000 more got saved. That's 5,000 in Jerusalem by the men who had gone fishing till they experienced the promise. Whew. They experienced the promise. I remember when Brett got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Raymond Kaysen was here. I don't even believe he preached on the Holy Ghost, did he, Brett? He was standing up here at a prayer line. <laughs> and the Holy Ghost came upon him and we was going out to eat after the service and Brett and Amanda were with us. And, and I guess he, he was all beside himself driving to the restaurant and as soon as we got there, he jumped out of the car. He said, I got to talk to you. I got to talk to you. I said, What is it, Brett? He said, Man, I was standing up there and I just started speaking in tongues. What in the world's going on here? That's what I'm saying. We wasn't even preaching on it. What an awesome experience. What an awesome experience. I got to ask you this morning is that what you desire? If you don't desire it, you're not going to get it. Well, preacher, why do I need it? I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Well, so were the disciples, but Jesus said they needed it. And he's no respecter of persons. And you've got ministry to do out there too. Tell me one reason why you don't. Tell me one reason why you don't need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And I'll show you ten why you do. Matter of fact, I'm doing that already. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 12, spirit baptized apostles, it says, performed many miraculous signs and wonders. How would you like to have that happening everywhere you go? Wouldn't that be awesome? Some of you, it's already happening in your life, isn't it? It's already happening. It's because the Holy Ghost is fully oper op operable in your life. You've allowed Him full operation. You've turned the throttle, the gas pedal, all of it over to Him. Would you go ahead and give Him the brakes too? Let him apply the brakes when they need to be and you stop applying the brakes. You, you just turn loose and let her go and let the Holy Ghost operate the brakes. I don't know, preacher. I like having the brake. How many of y'all are front seat, back seat drivers? I'm glad they, there's not a brake on the right side of our trailblazer because we'd be going down the road like this. <laughs> 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 that is probably true. <laughs> Stop, she doesn't have much depth perception and a truck can be a hundred yards away and she'll say, Look out! Here comes a truck! How many of y'all can identify with that? And here we are, Christians. Arch! Somebody smoking toast. Who was it? Who was it? Oh, it's the same one that does it every time. <laughs> Hallelujah, hallelujah. I heard somebody shout. Who was it? Would you let go of the brake and give the brake to the Holy Ghost? Did I get that point across? <laughs> Turn. That's not in my notes. The Lord, the Lord just gave me that illustration. <laughs> Acts chapter 6 and verse 5. Stephen. Uh oh, wait a minute. Hold on, preacher. <laughs> Stephen wasn't a disciple. He wasn't an apostle. I know. It wasn't just for the preachers, was it? Here Stephen was. A man full of the Holy Ghost. And what did he do? Great wonders and miraculous signs. 
Whoa, put the brakes on. You mean God wants me to have great signs and wonders following me? Yes, He does, Jamari May. He wants great signs following you, brother. He wants great signs following you, Austin. He wants great signs following you, Angel and Caitlin. He wants great signs following you. Get your foot off the brake. Get your foot off the brake. Philip, which, which apostle was Philip, Paul? What, would you say that again? You mean Philip wasn't an apostle? He was the guy from the food bank. Philip, Philip hadn't even spent three and a half years with Jesus. He got saved in Jerusalem, undoubtedly. And he was, you remember when they set up the money tables? I mean, the, the food tables, because, so the apostles could spend all their time praying and teaching. Oh, Lord, for those days. Y'all didn't get that at all, did you? So, Philip was over the food, making sure the widows had something to eat. And he got filled with the Holy Ghost, Dad. You know what? And he gave the breaks to the Holy Spirit. And he got out there, and he went, he went to preaching. He went to teaching whatever opportunity he had and miraculous signs and wonders followed Philip. How awesome is that? Yeah, that could be for you. That could be for you. You just, you just change your name to Philip and that could be you. But you don't even have to change your name to Philip. You can just use your own name. Jesus wants miraculous signs following you wherever you go. It's for you, it's for you, it's for you, it's for you. And then we go on. In Peter again in Acts chapter 9, 34 and 35 was used by God to heal a lame man and two entire cities turned to the Lord. We're praying for two cities, warrior in Hayden. Peter did it with, uh, with just a few messages and a few miracles. What would happen... What would happen if they did get out of their cars and start repenting out there in the parking lot? What, how, how, how widespread would that story go? On, on social media today, how far would that spread and how quick would that go viral? Can you imagine the revival spirit that would hit this city if that were begin to happen in any church in this city? You know, I want it to happen at RCF, but if we're going to be stubborn and won't allow it, then let somebody else do it. But I believe God wants us to do it. I believe God wants to start revival here. I believe it needs to happen here. And I'm going to do everything I can to pray for it and see that it does. How many of you are with me today? Then get filled with the Holy Ghost. You mean I've got to get filled with the Holy Ghost? Man, if I get through with the Holy Ghost, am I going to speak in tongues? Yes. No, no, I can't. I, I just, that would be me. That would be me, though, brother. That, you know, I, don't, I want to make sure it's not me. I want to make sure it's the Holy Ghost. Well, would you mind telling me how you are going to determine if it's you or the Holy Ghost? You ever spoken tongues before? Have you ever spoken tongues before? Then how are you going to know? Because God's not going to throw His voice and speak as a ventriloquist through you. He's going to use your voice, your vocal cords, and it's going to be your sound. So just go ahead and take that leap of faith and step out there. God says you ask Him for bread, He's not going to give you a rock. You're praying for the Holy Ghost. He's not going to give you a snake. It's not going to be a dem demonic spirit that's going to come and grab you. What a bunch of hogwash baloney that's been passed down from the pits of hell to discourage people from understanding the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of Holiness. I'm about to close. I'm about through. Two cities... Let us take this city. But if we're going to take this city, we've got to be full of the Holy Ghost. 
Peter, the same man that denied Jesus. Now we're up to chapter 9 in Acts. He raised a dead woman, Dorcas. Now, brother, you talk about some serious stuff now. You out there raising the dead, you talking about some serious business. If nothing else will get somebody's attention, that will get their attention. I'm always laughing when they throw the dead man and he's, he touches Elisha's bones and bounces back up to life in the Old Testament. <laughs> Whoa, I, I pray that they'll just throw a dead body. <laughs> throw a dead body in RCF in the lobby and he bounces up to life again. <laughs> Boy, you talk about going viral on the internet then, that'd get their attention, wouldn't it? Why, preacher, you're crazy. Well, it happened in the Bible. Why can't it happen in 2016? It does happen in other nations, doesn't it? You say, you re- preacher, you really think those things are going to happen? I know they're going to happen because in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and you shall prophesy and you'll have dreams, you'll have visions on handmaidens, on sons, on moms, on dads. Wow. You see, I've shown you all of these instances and we hadn't even got to the Apostle Paul. You see, he had all this, all the instances I've related to you, Saul to this point hadn't even got saved yet until chapter 9. He hadn't even got saved. His name is still Saul up to this point. He's still out there persecuting Christians. He's still a member of Al-Qaeda. He's still a member of ISIS. Huh? Yeah, he was persecuting Christians and executing them. It'll take a whole nother sermon just to introduce Paul, which I'm not going to do this morning. Can you see the difference the baptism and the Holy Ghost made in their lives? Can you see the importance? If you can't see the importance now of being baptized in the Holy Ghost, then brother, I don't know what else to tell you. I don't know any other way to convince you who is included in this promise in Joel chapter 2 verses 28 through 32. Robbie, get me those those scriptures up there. Joel chapter 2 verses 28 through 32. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And I know a young man that's had two visions in the last week. 13 years old, going to this church. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and Jerusalem there shall be deliverance as the Lord has said among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Can you find among those lists of people that this Spirit is going to be poured out on anywhere where you are an exception? Men, women, young women, young men, Old men, servants, handmaidens. It doesn't matter what walk of life you're in. The promise is for you. The promise is for you. Why would God not include you? I can't find a reason. So I'm just going to go ahead and accept. I'm just going to go ahead and believe that the baptism in the Holy Ghost is for me. He is for me. Would you bow your heads with me? Why would God leave you out? And then to turn that around just a little bit, why would any Jesus-loving person not accept this promise. 
from the Father. Why would any Jesus-loving person not want to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost? This baptism is for you today. Will you stop long enough, step out in faith, and trust Jesus to baptize you in the Holy Spirit?